Hello, good afternoon our esteemed viewers of uh, the Inter-University Interface. Today I'm joined by a panel of distinguished lady and gentlemen from uh, very distinguished universities. With me, I'm joined by a panel to discuss, uh, uh, to discuss issues reflecting on the events that shaped the year. So with me on this panel, I am joined by a gentleman from Cavendish University, a lady from uh, uh, Chambogo University and a gentleman from Mkumba University. Uh, I would just take a minute for them to introduce themselves, then we dive straight into the discussion today. You're most welcome, my dear panelists. I will start with you, uh, Mr. Aruh O'Brien. Please introduce yourself to the viewers and you're most welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, for starters, I'm Aruh O'Brien. I prefer the name Aruh, the African approach. I'm a second year law student speak of the Cavendish Law Society and I'm very much honored to be here. Following in, we shall um, delve into a few issues here and there that we feel you should also take part in and, you know, give 2023 a better chance at uh, each and every possibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aruho Brian. You're most welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Namu Gajwain from Chambogo University, a third year student pursuing a bachelor's degree in arts with education. I'm in my third year and I'm happy to be part of the show and to be part of the panel. Thank you. You're most welcome. welcome. Gentlemen, to my extreme left. <laughs> yes, sir. You're a, a, quite a common face on this show. Please introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Garang. Uh, Garang Quart Lester is my name. I'm a final year student of law at Kumba University. I am a member of the East African Community Youth Ambassadors Platform and I'm also a Yali alumnus, and I'm glad to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as, you, as you've heard and, and you've seen, the panel is quite distinguished, and uh, in their various capacities, we are going to be discussing a plethora of issues that shaped the events, that shaped the politics, that shaped the, uh, the, the economy, that shaped socially the events that happened in this country. So I would like to start with you, Garang. Um, from the month of February, um, when uh, Russia went in and invaded Ukraine. We saw what happened with, uh, with, with various economies around the world. I would like us to start from the month of February as we are reflecting on the events that shaped, uh, th that shaped the country. To take us through what happened via Russia, Ukraine and the, the, and the impacts that we're facing today in Uganda and in Africa at large. Okay, so thank you. So um, uh, from around February, like you clearly said, Russia started preparing to uh, what ultimately became the Ukraine invasion and uh, troops came closer to the border and speculations in media started coming that Russia was going to evade Ukraine and ultimately did uh, for security reasons as it said. And you know the world is a very connected world but if one thing happens in one part of the world it has implications on almost all corners of the world. Mm. So I think the implications of the of the Russian war in Ukraine, of course, other people call it Russian war in Ukraine, but I'd like to say Russian war in Ukraine, was mostly economic because because Russia is a top player in the in the global economy in terms of global supply chain, in terms of contribution to finances and stuff like that. But the response to that war was um, uh, massive sanctions on Russia, and the disconnection of Russia as a country from the global economic system. So. That disconnection had an obvious implications, but also Ukraine as a country has been uh, a supplier of cereals and other food uh, stuff to the rest of the world. So these things were disrupted by the war, and 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 and, and those things became implications on on the economies of the world and sub, uh, prices of goods in various parts of the world increased because supply was reduced, and also and also because of the disruption between trading with Russia, mm -hmm. ultimately because of the sanctions, it's not every country that continued to trade with Russia. Now, because of that, there was obvious implications on trade. But, but then also, re related to the war also, it, 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 the reaction, and I think it's important to underscore that even attached to the oil prices, Russia contributes to the global oil supply and the disconnection of the same uh, led to the same, the same idea, to, to the same uh, supply of oil, and then prices of oil skyrocketed, and supply chain disruptions and all those things. So 
So the, the, the economic implications of the war are dire on everyone, but even the political implications, because Russia as a country also was aware what would be the implications of invading that country. And the sanctions and the disconnection and, 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 and the Western reaction and, 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 and the, 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 the alternative or the, the, the strategy per se of, of, of attempting to uh, make other countries essentially disconnect with Russia also led to implications. And I think in, in, in our part of the world as, as East Africa or essentially as Africa, we, we are seeing it, a new proxy sort of a strategy that's happening, some, some, some form of Cold War. In the media, they call it the Cold War 2.0, another, another new brand of Cold War. Because right now, Russia is still competing for space in Africa and the rest of the, rest of the world, West is competing for space in Africa. And they, they are messages, coded political messages that allude to making Africans choose which side of which side to take, yeah. whether to go with Russia or to yeah. go with the West, and you even saw how Africans voted at the UN. Yeah. So ideally, it's, it's it's a big issue. But from February to when the real invasion happened, even to today, there has been track record of implications on both economy and the politics of the world. Mm. And like I just said, it's, it's a new Cold War, and we can't run away from it. So Very it's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're given quite. Uh, an, uh, quite an overview. Yeah. So just from there, I would like to bring in Miss Joan. Garang made mention that uh, that uh, Ukraine is amongst the largest suppliers or exporters of grain or cereal in the world. And we, we saw that with this invasion, there has been, Africa has been hit hardest because we get grain from Ukraine for us to make bread and etc. So is it then high time uh, as African countries we resorted to our form or should we then resort to uh, planting our own grain or is there a way for us to try to restrain ourselves from having these implications because many African countries are facing famine because of lack of grain? Well, thank you very much to that very question. Should we, in short, you're asking if we should grow our own wheat? Because when you look at Ukraine and Russia, it has affected the world as a whole and Africa as a continent as a whole. But when you look at Africa as a whole, specifically Uganda, we have fertile lands. I believe we can grow our own wheat. Mm -hmm. And if we grow our own wheat, that means we can, we can be in position to supply ourselves better. But then Uganda as a, itself has a problem. Yeah. They will grow their own wheat, which is good. But then they'll end up using, I don't know, how should I say it, fake, 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 like fake seeds to, to grow okay. them. Mm -hmm. Then maybe later on, they'll want to hype these prices. And you know, we Ugandans, we are very complicated people, I think, should I say Africans? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have a mentality that the West or the outside world has better quality products. Mm -hmm. And we Ugandans, ours are white, are fake. Sometimes. When I convince you that this is, these are seeds from America, or from Russia, you'd be like, I think that is a better quality. But when I tell you it, it was grown here on the Ugandan land, you'd be like, no way. That okay. is absolutely fake. From that, do you then think we possibly need to sensitize our people to love what we produce and embrace what we have? Yeah, I feel that people need to be sensitized. And most of them, the largest percentage is sensitized. But, that, but then what happens? The ignorant masses. You can be sensitized, but you remain ignorant. There are people that choose to remain ignorant. You get it. Mm -hmm. You will sensitize someone. It's like telling for there is HIV. You get it. But they will be like, ah, ah. It, I, I'm very sure I cannot contract it in that way. Past one minute, <laughs> I'll not get it. So when you tell them that our own products are very good, very few will buy it. Okay, they will believe it. But trust me, they will still pass, they will meander around yeah, yeah. and then sneak in those seeds from our brain. All right, all right, fair enough. Allow me to bring you, Brian, still on this uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Um, Garang made mention about uh, the political implications and how the Russia-Ukraine war is, is informing the politics of the world. Mm. We, saw, uh, we, we, saw the, the, we saw the foreign minister of, uh, of, Russia of Russia flying in in Uganda, and we saw what Uganda did. Oh. Uganda abstained <coughs> when voting against, uh, when voting against in, Russia in UN. invading into Ukraine. Um, I would like to pick your thoughts on, to, on, on the politics that is informing the world. Yeah. What do you think Africa as a continent is supposed to do? Are we supposed to take part in this? Or what people say, we leave the big boys to fight their own fights? <laughs> okay, uh, that's quite interesting when you say big boys. You see, when two elephants fight, 
it's the <coughs> rust that usually suffers. True. Yeah. And uh, well, this this is a word that Africa has nothing to do at all with. But uh, well, the other thing is that you can't bite the hand that feeds you. Mm. You see, that's that's another thing. So when you see countries like Uganda, obviously for obvious reasons, I also knew it was going to abstain. Is because you are trying to keep yourself in a position of I don't want to antagonize either party. Yeah. Yes. So you see, most African states, uh, countries like Uganda, are saying no, we shall abstain because I mean this is not our war, mm. and we know the, we know the implications we have. Yeah. Before we even look at the political implications, at least we 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 saw what the war alone, uh, what it did to our fuel prices. I mean, we had our fuel prices going way above normal. We had fuel going up to five thousand. I mean, how many Ugandans, even even if you're driving a Vitizo Espacio, how many Ugandans would would fuel that would would fuel that that car to full tank? It was more of you know the, the the big class, so you cannot say that you 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 cannot ideologically say that we shall not participate. Yeah, the the the, the foreign affairs minister came to Uganda, that had a big say because you see, then by the time he came to Uganda, that was the time when we came off the tweets by uh, General Mwazi Kenyarugaba. Mm saying that uh, Uganda is in support of Russia. Technically, that means that would antagonize our international standing, showing that uh, maybe we are supporting war. Mm. Yeah, because anyone who comes out and says, I'm in support of Russia, that means that you are in support of in invasions. But if, if had it been America, would it be the same story? It wouldn't be the same story. The story would be like, maybe we are giving them freedom or something like that. But yeah. this is a country that they're in conflicts with. We are, not, we are now looking at uh, more of uh, what he said. You are now at a stage where you are you're in for a cold war. So if you support if you support a certain dynamic, you're having certain implications. Mm. And you look at the political masterclass, and I wouldn't want to say it, but we have had a government that has been in power for you know over thirty years, and they're still counting. So you want to stay in power, right? Yeah. There is no way you're going to say that I'm going to support Russia. Mm. Obviously, deep down you have your support, but then you cannot you ca you cannot come out and expressly say I support Russia because you know the next thing that may happen in your own country is a coup. Because they'll be like, since you're supporting them, let's take you off. We bring a person who supports our ideology. And that is not something you would want. When you move down to that, we have had uh, our leaders going to the US. Yeah. You see, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are in support of the US. But you're just looking for survival. So we, we are in for a political masterclass of people that are uh, going in for survival, survival globally. But coming down to the African context, again, you don't want to antagonize the interests of your people against a certain fight that is happening somewhere. Yeah, so that is it. Just survive for the fittest. All right. Hmm. Um, what I pick from your con what your argument is, what we are in as a country or as hmm. a continent is just we are now doing politics of survival. Exactly. And this is going to bring us back now to home or back to Africa, back to Uganda, back to East Africa. Hmm. We have talked about the Russia and Ukraine war. Hmm. And we are reflecting on the events that shaped the country hmm. differently. Hmm. So... All of you in your arguments made mention that the, the, the war of Ukraine and Russia has economically affected various economies around the world. I would like us to reflect on, particularly, uh, particularly on, 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 on how hard African continent has been hit and how hard Uganda has been hit. Um, we have just <coughs> recently concluded the pandemic that is okay, still going on, mm. the COVID-19. And right after COVID-19, we see Russia invading Ukraine. And then when that happens, we saw uh, fuel prices skyrocketing. And when fuel prices skyrocketed high, uh, a recent report showed that uh, the inflation rate of Uganda is now at 10.7%. Mm. So I'd like to start with you, Garang. As we near or as we end the year, do you think as Uganda, as the African continent, do we still, do we have any more shock absorber left for us to continue absorb, absorbing the, the blows that we are receiving on our various economies? Uh, well, I think uh, the short answer is we, we do and we don't. Mm -hmm. And the long one is this. You see, the, 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 there, is, there is resilience that comes from surviving tough times. So when you have been hit hard so many times, you become as, as hard at the things that yeah. hit you. So if we have gone through COVID, and, and I think it's been one of the hardest things I have witnessed since I was born, frankly. I wasn't there when World Wars happened, so COVID was the biggest thing. Yeah. And then also, we survived COVID, yeah. technically we are alive. Yeah. And then also, we, we, we have gone through the economic hits from the war in Ukraine, 
for the war between Russia and Ukraine. And now we are still here. So we're looking into 2023 and what other harder things could come. Whatever it is, I think we will we can survive it. Like we can. But what we need to now do as a country is how do we prepare to survive such things so that the way we were hit by the two events of 2022 or from 2020 uh, to now is 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 a lot does we are not hit as tough as we were hit by the two events or any other events that will come so that that that, that may be where we should speak into because i think as as a country we need to invest in 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 self reliance mm -hmm. you see in international law we study about sovereignty yeah. but what we don't really appreciate is the variables upon which the whole principle of sovereignty actually rests. Because if you want to claim sovereignty as a country, but you cannot fund half of your of your budget, then how sovereign should you be? If you claim sovereignty and even your own security is not guaranteed by your own means as a country, then you are not sovereign. But also if you are sovereign and you cannot genuinely decide at a forum like the UN to take a stand, because you know you can defend your stand on all grounds, then you're not sovereign. Those may be the, the, the areas we want to look into. Because my, my dream, possibly... I would, I would like to yes. ask you a particular question on sovereignty. You, 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 you bring up a very fascinating and interesting conversation about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. But then, don't you think the aspect of sovereignty then comes a matter of politics? Because we see the people who claim that they're sovereign are those ones that have the financial muscle. Mm -hmm. And as the, Afri the African continent, for example, Uganda, who lacks the financial muscle, would then those states... you uh, be termed as states that are not sovereign because Uganda can, most of its budget is being mm. uh, it's being funded. Mm. So does then the aspect of sovereignty sway away from just mm. us saying sovereignty, but just look at the aspect of politics? Uh, absolutely. You see, you see, and 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 that's what I was saying. So it is hard to argue sovereignty if you're not self-reliant. Yeah. If I feed you, I will make you do anything, mm. and including selling to me your sovereignty. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. So if a country like Uganda, for example, has over 50% of its budget funded by, by donor funding or borrowing from the countries with mercy, technically, <laughs> that, means, yeah. that means they cannot be sovereign. Because the hand that feeds you, like Brian said, is, you cannot bite it. Sure. So if there is a stance that Uganda needs to, to take, in international spaces, like at the UN or any other space, and the stance would require them to go against that hand, they will not go because they want to be fed tomorrow. So as a country then, to be able to survive such things, we need to have strategies that make us truly sovereign to an extent that we have economic reliance on ourselves, we have political reliance. Because today, if we have a security issue, we may have to hire companies from the US, from Russia, or from, from France, or from any other part of Europe to look into our security space and advise accordingly. Can we then transition to a situation where we can trust our own muscle in terms of intelligence and security and say we can trust our own selves? Mm. Economically, can we fund a chunk of our budget? Uganda is highly indebted to both local, um, local people and also internationally. Mm. So if you, can, if you have not paid debt, you don't look like you will stop borrowing. How then can you argue sovereignty? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Mm. So if we have to look into 2023 and be able to look at mechanisms for us to survive other heats, because the next heat might be a real cold war, where you will yeah. be forced to choose whether to go left or to go right, right. to go east or to go west. Sure. If you cannot choose either to go east or west because you don't know where your next food will come from, then you're not sovereign. Mm. So my speculation is the next big thing like COVID and the war might be... <laughs> A, a, a thing that targets our sovereignty because Cold War has come and it is it is growing as you can see. Sure, sure, so yeah. what if tomorrow America wants you to actually choose? choose. Because what is coded? I mean, I've been listening. You are you, you you talked about the the no, it was Brian, the the the, the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. Mm. The the undertone politically and undertone from America is as African leaders, where do you fall? Mm. Are you of the East or of the West? Are you with Russia and China or are you with us? Mm. And they cannot choose frankly because, I mean, what if you choose China and they don't feed you tomorrow? Mm -hmm. What if you choose Russia and they don't feed you tomorrow? America is already feeding you and why wouldn't you choose them? So ideally, what if tomorrow it's actually true? They're not coding the language. They're actually asking you to choose. What will you do? And are you ready for the implications of that choice? That is where we need to start thinking into it.
actually mm-hmm. maybe to 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 add in uh, you know quite a number of years back the first time when president museveni refused to sign uh, the homosexuality thing true, true. you you realize uh, the government of norway cut 75% funding to makere university because we made a stand that was against their culture so that comes back to self reliance if, if you cannot talk about sovereignty if you're never self reliant that that is the thing that is strange the moment you say that we are sovereign then things like independence they will have meaning mm. but now you can you, you see it becomes very delusional for you to celebrate independence day when you cannot even cater for the own funding of the independence day yeah? yeah so you have to look at your budget if you can fund 65% of your budget from your own hands then you're good to go at least for the start but if you cannot even fund 15% of your own budget with your own currency yeah then you at a, you you are at, at no point that you hold the power to negotiate in anything you don't have the leverage you don't have the audacity to even advise those people yours will maybe maybe to attain get the per diem and come back yeah. but things like negotiating for your space those things are not there. <clears throat> all right i have a question for you mr aruho just from, from what mr garang was arguing mm-hmm. that the aspect of sovereignty should come from as a state being positioned to independently and competently uh and sufficiently uh fund its budget cater for its all its administrative costs and all the likes now we have seen that there is quite a normal f- phenomenon in most african countries mm-hmm. the aspect of the disease of corruption <laughs> even the money that we get um the 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 money that we get as what karang says mm-hmm. out of mercy the money that is given to us out of mercy out of, out of um, mercy we still misappropriate it yeah speak to the heart of corruption mm. and as we as we move to the next year in your position what do you think we can do and when you answer that i would like joan to come in and tell us is there hope mm. should the ordinary ugandan lose hope should the ordinary african lose hope for the next coming year mm. please take us to that yeah well <laughs> wow corruption <laughs> 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 you see you see <laughs> The, there is a thing that came around this year is it this year i don't know or even last year twebe de demo i i i happen to work with uh, a few colleagues university students and we're trying to follow the covid funding saga mm. yeah and uh, I, put, uh, I i think you also saw the letter that moved around uh, the time when um, we got a big chunk of funding about covid and it was i think amounting to 2 million us dollars mm. from the us aid and they clearly said that they sent 2 million us dollars mm. what on tv what was narrated on tv was that we had received 1 million us dollars so that means 1 million went into the hands of other people they are big players in the country you can't just come out and name them but then just to start with that if we had actually used that 1 million to facilitate i mean it would be very far if we had said to use all the 2 million but then again corruption is something we may not be able to win in the current standing mm-hmm. yeah because it corruption moves way alongside even money it even goes into how you employ people and and all these other things so as to whether we are going on the right path that mm-hmm. may be a discussion for 2023 mm-hmm. but yes we can do implement the problem is that when you're implementing you reach at a, you reach at a certain stage of implementing your directives and there is a click of people as we were discussing earlier the glass ceiling mm. the people will actually say you do this we can get you demoted you do this we can actually get you killed so corruption had we used this money for our own development would be far the co- let's let's come down to the covid thing because i think that's where we got the biggest scandals we saw during covid people were actually dying and then we have apartments going up at a very fast rate yes covid cases for example in buhejo um mm. in buhejo one of the government officials from ministry of health was found with 15 cases of ministry of health for covid covid-19 response in his parking yard and what were they doing with them they were actually spraying off the thing of covid-19 that the <laughs> they were spraying it off i mean the car was white the pickup was white and they are spraying them and they found people in the process so if we if we can start with leaders being really accountable for something it's just being having a human heart you see when you are a leader you're not only serving your in- interests but you're also serving the interests of the people so if you misappropriate funds then you have no you you have no audacity to wake up at a certain point x and say 
look, let's not be corrupt. You have to start with your own actions, yeah? Because the more you, the more corrupt uh, tendencies you have, the, the bigger your behavior gets, yeah. then the less are the implementations we have. Look at COVID. Had we decided to use all the money to maybe set up uh, centers in every hospital, maybe let's say let's go to every <coughs> parish, let's, even if it's not necessarily a health center for, let's have tents, let's, let's educate the people, let's, let's use the money, let's pay the health workers. That's why you see health workers are still striking because some of them put their hearts at risk, their health at risk, their lives at risk, and they're not being paid. Reason there is a political hegemony of people that think they have directives over everything. All right, so. All right. fair enough. Um, which means the fight against corruption is still a long one to go. It's a long However, one to go. I would like to engage with you, Miss John. You are pursuing bachelor's in arts of education, and as a teacher to be, in your future career and your future profession, wow. you you have a task and you have a job that, in your profession that you're going to pursue, your mandate is to educate the future leaders. Um, what role do you have to play in that, that your capacity to see that we fight hard to do away with corruption? Because it has eaten up our economy, it has eaten up our continent. What role do you have to play? Well, thank you very much. Now, regarding the issue of corruption, corruption has not just started today. Yeah. And it, has not, it, it, has, it is not going to just come in the future. It has, been, it has been a long way. I mean, if you look at me here, mm -hmm. if I have a little brother at home, Corruption starts with me. Mm. I want to go out and see my boyfriend, right? Mm. Now, if I want to go out and see my boyfriend, I have to bribe him. Mm. You know what, Jerry? Mm. Don't tell mommy that I'm not around. Mm. I'll bring a what? A sweet. A sweet. So when I come back, mm. I'm bringing who? Mm. I'm bringing Jerry a sweet. When I bring him a sweet, he'll not say it. Mm. So that is already what? Corruption. Corruption. I'm bribing him. And Even Jerry will tell who? Mm. The other one. She went out. But don't tell her. Let me give you what? A share. Mm. That is already what? Corruption. It starts from our household. Mm. Then it goes on to the next level, yeah. slowly by slowly. But then what am I going to do as a teacher to deal with this corruption? I think I need to first tell my siblings themselves, the people I start, the people I live with first, that, you know what, this and this is not right. How do I do that? I should not sneak out. And if I don't sneak out, that means I'm not going to need to bribe him. Mm. Okay, if I'm, to, if I'm to go out, I'll need to first inform my parents that maybe I'm going to see her, a friend, not yeah. my boyfriend, obviously, because mm. right now it will look like a crime. You get, she's in my house mm. and you yeah, get, so, yeah. you get the self -reliant, yeah. Yes. Mm. So the only solution is not to tell, is not to go and see this boy. Mm. And by not seeing him, I will not need to bribe my siblings. Mm. So when it comes to the level of a teacher themselves, yeah. These students, the students I'm going to teach, I'll need to mentor them. I'll need to tell them the dangers of corruption. But then I'm telling them the dangers of corruption, how to overcome it. But then the top, the top officials are doing it. And it is, it is live on air everywhere. We're not going to hide it. We're not going to that it is not there. Very shameless. Of recent, I was reading a story on, on Twitter. This guy was like, he, he was taking the wife to, the wife was in labor. She was, she was having those labor pains, then she was going to, to the, he was going to the hospital. Sure. The, the, the wife was literally dying. Mm -hmm. Then they met, they met those police officers along the way. Then the police officer stops him. The, remember the, high, the, the driving at a high speed? He tells them why you're over speeding. Give me what you have. Then he's like, but my wife is dying. He's like, what do you have? So he's like, give me 5,000. The guy only, only had 10,000. You get They gave him the 10,000. Then the police officer's like, I don't have change. But remember, his wife is white, is in labor. So they had to rush, and he cannot come back to demand for that 5,000. Now, if I see such a story on Twitter, how many people have seen it? Very many people have seen it. It's not only me who has seen it. So I'd be like, so if I also overspeed, that means I'll need to bribe the officer. And I will not say that we can tell people to stop overspeeding because there are some, there are some circumstances that we need you to, to do what you are doing. Mm. And you're not going to explain to anyone. And the only way out is to bribe. Mm. You get it. So right. I don't think we are going to do it with corruption. Yeah. Yeah. We can just sensitize the masses. Mm. It's, it's all right. dangerous. It's all right. All right. Maybe to, to, add, to add in to what you're saying. Mm. Um, one of the reasons that I was saying again earlier on is that uh, as to why corruption may not be something to win right now is because, uh, as she said, you're going to reach at a certain point X and say, yes, I'm going to overspeed, I know I'm going to overspeed, mm -hmm. so I put emergency money here. 
it's because it's something that has already been cultivated and cultured in people that look pa, uh, what 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 is it called per action mm. you know there is the, the, there is there is a resolution to something there is a remedy so you know if i overspeed mm. and this guy gets me i'm going to give him a 5k i'm going to give him a 10k so you, you already know so you're not on pressure you have the fuel money this side, but you know, should the guy ask you, you'll have, we've you, 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 yes, you'll have like three, two K not see us what it looks like. You had a lot of money, like, but then you know, let me give you, you get, but if we have leaders saying that corruption is bad and they say, let's implement that, not, not organizing national prayers to end corruption. Hmm. No, that, that doesn't help corruption in any way to, you cannot organize national prayers because when you organize the national prayers, again, you're going to ask for money yeah. to organize the national prayers, the money. The budget you're going to be put, you're going to put in, is going to be inflated by certain people. So again, indirectly, you are going to promote corruption because when you're looking at corruption, let's even just take it down. Normally, you're going to look at money. That's what most people look at. So, national prayers cannot be a solution to that. But if you have advocacy, <clears throat> if you have, for example, is a debater, we have, <clears throat> you are also a debater. When you have people actually taking up something, advocating for it, and saying, "Look." Corruption is bad. We know it's bad. These are the disadvantages. Can we desist from it? Can we teach? Because now we have corruption going back now to our young siblings. Mm. Yeah. Can we teach these people not to be corrupt? Can we teach them what corruption means? What the formats of corruption are? So that when someone is doing something, they have a moral sense of view. They're like, no, if I do this, this is corrupt. You know, because when you start the tendency in primary, you cannot end it in secondary. Because when you reach in secondary, there's a stronger urge for you to maybe hold a certain office. Right. So you will do anything it takes for you to hold that office, push you to the next office. So to break down corruption, we need to be very human people. We need to advocate and we need to act on the advocacy. Fair enough. You talk, you talk about um, advocacy and in, be people driven with impact. People yeah. were intentional on fighting corruption. Well, this will lead us then to the discussion General Altamita is the institution of parliament. Um, for, for the viewers who are, who are joining us, we are discussing uh, stock issues or events that uh, shaped the year differently. So as I said, I'm joined by a panel that is quite dis distinguished. So right now we're going to talk about, we've talked about Ukraine, the impacts and, and, and the rest. Mm. So right now when we're talking about the, the institution of parliament, it's been quite unfortunate that uh, we have lost some people along the way. Yeah. Uh, key figures that could have possibly taken this nation further. So at this moment, I would like to uh, give Garang to, first of all, because you talked about corruption, and every time when you speak about corruption, the institution of parliament doesn't cease to suffice. Mm -hmm. So Garang, I would like you to first tell us or hint, the, uh, hint about the institution of parliament. We saw the events that happened. We saw the Speaker of Parliament, the cars they bought for the, the speakers. <laughs> uh, later on, we saw the gifts and uh, among others. So as an institution of Parliament, um, <clears throat> many people would argue that it's a, it's, it's, it's a matter of leadership. The character of leadership that we have in this country is lacking. So please, elaborate on one, the role Parliament has played, whether it has rather, uh, whether Parliament has just accelerated corruption or rather it has advocated on the de on the deterioration of corruption and then when you're done speaking about that speak to the heart of leadership of this country as we reflect on what happened this year <laughs> oh it's a quite a piece of work <clears throat> but but i'll do it yeah. you see corruption is is an inherent human trait I, I like to say that human beings are inherently selfish you see selflessness Oh my God, I'm selfless. I give people. I can't do this. Is a privilege of abundance. Yeah. Okay. So if we are all reduced to a position of scarcity, we the default position is we will be selfish and we will look out for our own selves. Mm -hmm. That is indisputable. You can try it. Mm -hmm. Put people in a scarce island where there's no water. People will, there is no food. They will eat their own children. They will do what they want to survive. That's just how human beings are. So the the fight for corruption. I, I think has a lot of misplacement because mm. the biggest effort is put at mm, uh, sensitization about the bads about corruption, or oh, corruption is bad, or oh, we should stop it. Mm. Trust me, Douglas, no one doesn't know corruption is bad. Mm. Like no one doesn't. Even my 16-year-old cousin in P7 knows how bad corruption is. 
But if in a position where they can be corrupt, they have access to being corrupt, they will be corrupt. So where should the focus on fights of corruption mm -hmm. should be? Like Brian said, even if we pray, corruption will not leave. But if, if we make it impossible for even if someone wants to be corrupt, mm -hmm. they will not be corrupt, then we will be fighting. Yeah. Because if you don't have access to state resources at your 24 hours, seven days a week disposal, you will not necessarily be corrupt. Your heart will want to be, but you don't have access. Yeah. So if people, if the process of acquiring state resources for corrupt um, means is hard, we will be fighting corruption. For example, if you digitize the whole payroll system, mm. you make it easier to track publicly how, who is paid what, the budgeting process from where, how the money comes in to where it goes. From taxation, we have collected this amount of money it has been digitized. Yeah. A normal citizen can know how their money goes mm. by simply going into maybe a system or whatever it is. Everyone that is working for the state is being paid digitally. We know their bank account. We know how they earn. If they have anything outside what we pay them, we know what it is. Mm. Then it will be very easy to verify who is being corrupt. And it will be even very easy to track where that money that they have, been, they have, they have access to has come from. But the, that process is highly polarized. It's highly polarized. We don't know who is paid, how many. There may even be ghost people on payroll being paid for mm -hmm. plethora of, of things they are doing. Mm -hmm. The whole system is not streamlined. That's why corruption is rampant. Mm -hmm. So if we shift our focus from saying that corruption, we can eradicate it, to making it hard even for the most corrupt yeah. to be corrupt, mm -hmm. we will win. I am sure we will win. Because if I know how I pay you, and I know where my money is. I know I have to pay the three of you from this amount of money. You say, this is 10 million. I'll pay three of you. And this is how I pay you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Or even if I give it to Douglas, I know Douglas is going to pay. Joanne is yeah. going to pay. Brian is going to pay himself. And I know what will remain. If anything happens, we can easily ask Douglas it's where it has gone. What makes corruption really hard is it is hard to track what has gone through corruption and what has gone through real public service or expenditure. So if that process is streamlined, we can win. Now, the, the leadership and, and, and parliament, you see, our parliament is a very complicated place. <clears throat> like, honestly, very, very complicated. <clears throat> First thing is, it, it has become, it has become uh, a center of, a center of, 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 of enrichment and, and self-acquisition mm -hmm. by individuals. We know that the epitome of success is if you become an MP, mm -hmm. because you're going to be given a car, you're going to be paid lots of millions of shillings and, and all those things. The idea of leadership has gotten lost between what we get from being a parliamentarian to, to what we are supposed to ideally do in parliament. Mm. So it has become a fight for a space to earn and defense for that space. Mm. So everyone that has made it to parliament will do cutthroat competition to yeah. keep that space or to even enrich it. Everyone that has not gone there will fight down throats to get that position. Now, leadership gets lost from there because inherently leadership is supposed to be, as a leader, you, you, you essentially are supposed to first acknowledge the presence of the people you lead and to appeal to their aspirations. And then you can lead them with vision. You can tell where you want them to go and then you lead them to that position. That is when people will follow you. Our leaders do not necessarily have a vision of where they want us to go. They may have vision of where they personally want to go. Mm -hmm, sure. Because as a speaker, maybe my vision is to own the latest Mercedes Benz. That's my own vision. But is that the vision of the Ugandan people that I technically lead in the parliament of Uganda? Mm -hmm. Sadly not. So that's how parliament has become a distorted ground. But also even parliament is a very unique feature in the leadership of the state because that's, that's where laws that govern the yeah. country are made. The biggest policies that guide state are the laws. If you want people to stop smoking, enact laws against uh, tobacco, yeah. people will stop smoking. If people want them to drink less, enact laws. So the, 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 the legislation as a policy uh, guiding principle is very important. So if the institution that actually should legislate is that distorted, everything else becomes fundamentally distorted. I mean, corruption as a thing. Yeah. So it is hard to fight corruption because the laws are not implemented. Mm -hmm. It is hard to actually make this process of paying and, and streamline, like I said earlier, because the parliament is not doing that. The parliament is doing a lot of other things mm -hmm. than what they're supposed to actually do guide the state. So leadership is a crisis. And, and maybe as a country, as we go into 2023, 
we may want to start thinking about how do we improve the process of, 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 of leadership? How do we have better leaders than the people that... <laughs> Uh, I like to say that we are leading a very poor country by rich people. Mm. But if you can give <laughs> a range over, you are rich. Mm. But then you, the country cannot fund half of its budget. But the people that run that country are gifting each other right. such cars. Mm. So it's very complicated. That's just kind of just on that, yeah. briefly comment on uh, the, the Vinci deal, the coffee deal, <clears> that yeah. parliament had to legislate about, and I would like to applaud them for what they did mm. by saying the deal was unconstitutional. Mm. Mm. You're done commenting on that. I would like Aruho O'Brien to come in and then tell us briefly whether the institution of parliament is losing value, and then conclusively, mm. uh, I would bring in Joanne to pick her thoughts on what the FDC and NUP members of parliament were arguing about members of parliament mm. being the ones to uh, vote for the president. Please. Mm. So, uh, like, like you said, like you said, the 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 deal was was essentially a very terrible deal, yeah. like on all grounds, yeah. economic yeah. and even political, even yeah. grounds. It was a very bad, sadly bad deal. Yeah. But even even when the parliament later realized that there was a mistake made and then it should have been corrected, I, I'm going to ask questions around why the mistake was made first, and that's where the problem is. Yeah. Because what that means is they are several other mistakes like that that have been made even if parliament has not come out because the reason why parliament essentially legislated against the deal or even commented against the deal was because of how how people reacted especially how media reacted and public intellectuals reacted on media people started commenting people that sell coffee and people other people that feel the deal was sadly bad and even from the idea that coffee has been a very important cash crop that we actually export and then for something like that to come that outcry then provoked parliament perhaps mm. to, to, to come as it did. So let, let's ask the, the, the fundamental question. Why do such things happen? Because it's not only the, 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 the deal, like the awarding of, of contracts mm. by government, for example, that's where such things come from, where the, the Vinci Coffee Company and, and the government entered into that sort of float deal. There are other float things like that. So the policy question then is, why should such things be happening at a time like now? If we want to pave way into a better future, why should such things happen? Because it, there is a hospital that has failed to pick up <coughs> um, in Lubawa. Yeah. yeah. True. The, because of such deals, mm. you don't know the history of a company. The company has been formed perhaps two or three months to the deal. You award contract to that company. There is no track record of success, but you still award billions of shillings mm -hmm. to such companies or you still try to strike such deals with mm -hmm. such companies so ideally the question then is does the government have a strategy that awards government uh, government contracts to to private institutions or that guides how government enters into private deals with private companies to implement government actions yeah. mm -hmm. if that question then is answered then all the rest depends on that because that's the principal thing so the coffee, the coffee deal, but even, even when Parliament spoke against it, to what, what happened? You know, what, what then happened? So ideally, did the deal... Uh, of course, Parliament must have guided the withdrawal of the deal. Mm -hmm. But if it was withdrawn, the thing that created the necessity to have a deal with a private company still persisted. So do we have a, a, a framework that will make us then choose a better company or a better strategy in place? Uh, and, and, and those are the things we should be addressing as we go to next year right. and for Fair enough. Yeah. Well, just on the coffee deal, you know, the president is advocating for value <laughs> addition, among yeah. others. Yes. So I think for, for the aspect of uh, the Vinci deal, was primarily his mm. argument is on value addition. Mm. But thanks for your thoughts on that. Mm. Uh, I would like to bring in Aru O'Brien to comment. Garang has posed very critical and fundamental questions on the professor. institution of, 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 uh, of parliament. <laughs> I would like you to tell us whether the institution of parliament is losing value. Wow. Eh? <laughs> As to whether it's losing value, I think that is, uh, <laughs> wow. It's, it's like asking if our economy is being bad or good. Mm. There, is, there is a standard answer, it's really losing value. Um, have, having a, par a, a parliament that can actually sit and uh, have two debate sessions on whether nyege nyege should happen or not, I think that really gives us an answer. Mm -hmm. Having a parliament where the MPs alone have left their comrades to be in jail for one year, eight months, and still counting on is also something to, to look into. Having a parliament that has failed to 
a NAC laws that can even help us fight corruption mm. is also something to look into because you know earlier on we were discussing about corruption. If our parliament, if I know I know they can be competent if they decide to, mm. things like corruption will no longer be there. It takes a small session for you guys to actually sit and say, let's enact a law that is going to punish corrupt people. Maybe let's say, I, I, I know people may say this is bad. We can say, let's, let's put it to hanging. We, we, we find you guilty, we hang you. But, let me, but we have had laws, very, very good laws yeah, to, to the effect, but they've not been implemented. Theoretical. Mm. But they're there. They're there, theoretical. It's because, again, you cannot catch the, cat fish, the, the big fish. I mean, the person who's, fund, who, who's giving you money to speak, you may not necessarily go back and you know, bite them. Mm -hmm. But if... You can't, you can't speak as you, talk, you can't eat as an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, 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 if you have a parliament that can actually make a stand. Recently, you remember um, um, when uh, the deputy speaker went to a conference and said that parliament I lead cannot enact laws that will support homosexuality. You remember that video? Yeah. That was a stand. And I know our parliament may not necessarily... Make... So if they, if they can really <coughs> advocate on such things, then they can actually do. But now you're having people being mesmerized by Range Rover, by Mercedes-Benz, then it becomes a national topic. You're having people that have left their comrades be in prison for over so long. And, that is the... and when someone tries to come out and speak sense, the person is attacked. We've had a number of censure motions. Really, you have a, you enter parliament, over 400 MPs, but then you have a parliamentary session of around 30 MPs. Mm. 30. Out of over 400? Out of 500, counting. 512, yeah. Yeah. But then the number of sessions, I can tell you, now like the sessions this week, I have not watched any session where there were <coughs> over 42 MPs. So again, it comes down to the quality of leaders we send there because, you know, we voted, we voted uh, according to a wave. I wouldn't want to make this political, but then the thing was that what about yellow ticking? What about red ticking? So you don't even know the person. You don't know whether they were leaders before. Colors, not You're people. voting colors. I mean, you, you don't want your family to be attacked if you're a businessman. You want yeah. people to continue coming to your business. You're like, ah, since I'm in a region of red, I'll vote red. Mm -hmm. Since I'm in a region of yellow, mm -hmm. I'll vote yellow. That's what happened in Intungamo. I mean, in, in Tungamo, you wouldn't vote any person who wasn't NRM. That was it. Mm. Same way they said it was red. All right. Th th that, that was the deal, be being frank. So as to whether you guys are actually sending in, because by the time someone goes to parliament, they really, really need to understand certain things. You have to have critical thinking. Mm. You have to be a person who is good at advocacy. Maybe you are already better. Yeah. You have to have the art of implementation. But if you have people that want to go there to you know, to, as I said before, it mm. is a sense of richness. So people are looking at me being an MP as a profession, mm. not me going there to help people. You see, now that's the difference of leaders we have. That much as I don't, uh, much as I believe in Pan Africanism, when you go to countries like Russia and uh, Britain and stuff, yeah. you're finding these MPs taking the train, mm. going to parliament. Yeah? And then they, when they reach there, they are really going to advocate on something, not because of the salary, because even their salaries are not that fat. Mm -hmm. So people here are going to fight tooth and nail to become an MP because they know, one, they will pay off the debts that they incurred in. I mean, it's a profession right. here. Right. Because by the time you have, let's start with the normals. By the time you have us, the taxpayers, buying for someone a car, that really means a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So his his response and conclusion is that the institution of parliament has lost value. Mm. That's exactly. his argument. He says we have a parliament <coughs> that debates, that comes and debates issues to do with nyege nyege. Two, two sessions. <laughs> two sessions <laughs> of a parliament that spends two sessions <laughs> discussing our, our views on nyege nyege. Our, our dear viewers who are joining us, we are discussing events that shape the year. So as before we go for the commercial break, I would like to pick the views of uh, Joan. John, uh, you know Parliament has a mandate and role to come and to, to, to come and legislate oversight appropriation among others. Uh, there was a debate that arose during the year about uh, MPs being the one to vote for the president, and uh, the FDC, the NOB, and uh, the DP. Generally, the opposition were against it. Um, what do you have to say, as uh, in your capacity? Do you think? The, do you think Parliament did their role right to 
uh, the aspect of democracy? Oh, uh, well, first of all, how many MPs do we have? We have over 500. And, uh, there are over 500. And yes. how many belong to the, oppo to the opposition? And then how many belong to the ruling government? That is a very big question. Because now when you look, you might find that the NRM people are more than the opposition. When they come to vote, obviously the ruling government is going to have a higher say sure. than the opposition. Sure. Where does that leave the opposition? Obviously, it will be like, we are going to go with a majority. And you realize but that... isn't that the aspect of democracy? Because yes, it the is people that. in it's... parliament represent the people? It is aspect of democracy. Yes. Really we shall also go with the majority. <laughs> yeah. But you realize that there are still some opposition members that that will get, we shall say corruption. They'll, they'll be given money. Mm. We shall call it corruption, as we've been saying. Mm. They'll be bribed. You get. Mm. When they get bribed, they'll, they'll vote in favor of the motion. Mm. Remember, these are the people we sent ourselves. We voted these people into power. Like mm. Brian has been saying, we are choosing colors. We are voting colors. We are not voting. That I know this person, they are capable. Yeah. Things of that. So we're voting. Why are you an umbrella? What are umbrella? <laughs> Taking a What are the Those are the kind of people we did. We voted into power. Mm. And those very people are the ones disturbing us. Small, small monies. Mm. And, and they've already switched sides. I mean, what is wrong with, with a whole country, a population of over 48 million people voting for the president? It has always been like that. I don't think that is a very huge budget. We've always been doing it. Then why can't we continue doing it? Okay. I, th I don't think it has a problem. Now, the members of parliament coming up and deciding for the whole Uganda that they themselves should vote, this, uh, they should vote the president by themselves. Mm. I don't think it is a very good idea because it is very easy to come. Because now, remember, that they will have reduced the number of people they're going to approach. Mm. If, if they're to come for a name, they'll be like, yes, we shall call him one on one. Mm -hmm. They meet you. Then they'll go to Masaka. How many MPs are in Masaka? The woman counselor in Masaka. It will be very easy. To what? Mm. To corner mm. them and make them submit. Okay. You get. Mm. But now when it's a very huge population, mm. I feel it will be they'll, they'll just send one member of parliament yeah. to go back to their constituency and then convince the masses. And that is going to come with again a lot of money, just like they did in the Toji Kwataku thing. All right. So, it is the same thing right. that is going to happen. And, and, and maybe you had talked about corruption. Mm. It's now there, it becomes very hard to even break corruption. Mm. Yeah, because you know that the number of MPs you're dealing with. If he's the president, he will not know these other people I'm dealing with. So whether you're in opposition, because not every MP in opposition is opposition, right? Mm. So when you say let, the, let, let, let them vote for the president, maybe you may say maybe to keep you know the image good because we have seen countries that have passed through MPs and they vote for mm. competent presidents. Yeah? yeah. But now you're going to be in a state whereby now it will be a war to become an MP because someone would tell, will tell you I would rather invest five billion to mm. become. And MP because they know the rewards are going to be great. I mean, what you know, it means a lot to vote for a president. So yeah. the person will fund, will fight. If it means killing the opponents, they will do so, provided he becomes an MP because he knows at a certain point X, I'll be cornered to vote for the president, and I'll put in my name. No, if you guys are not giving us money, we are not doing this. So again, you'll have leaders that are not competent, yeah. and secondly, you'll have, um, you know, when they corner you, either it might be money or something. Yeah. Now let's say you let's say you're a leader who we are not all clean people, mm. but previously somehow somewhere you were in a land scandal, but it didn't go to the media. So this guy tells you, oh, actually you failed to vote. We shall put this in the media. Uh -huh. So you'll have people voting for someone not because the black, person is competent, mm. but because there is blackmail. There is a bondage. You right. are actually a slave. So right. we shall have leaders who are slaves mm. and not leaders who are actually implementers. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for the viewers who are just joining us right now. We are discussing uh, events that shaped the, that shaped the country differently, politically, economically, and socially. For now, we are going to go for a short commercial break. Please do not touch your dial. We'll be back shortly. Thank you. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create, and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices, and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten, and a right for protection of minors among others. 
The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Our esteemed viewers, welcome from that short commercial break. Uh, with me here, I'm joined with, uh, by, with a panel of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. We are dissecting or discussing, uh, we are reflecting on uh, the events that shaped the country differently. In the first segment of the show, we talked about the impact of the Ukraine-Russia war on African countries. We discussed about the institution of parliament and the corruption therein. So before we move into the next events or discuss other issues that shaped the country, I would like us to just, uh, I would like my panelists to just take a minute and then uh, talk about the legacy of the late Jacob Olanya, who passed on on, uh, who passed on, on who passed on on March 20th in the US. Kindly, uh, I'll start from my extreme left. Take a minute, talk about the legacy of the late Olanya. Let me move on to the next, as all my panelists. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, the, the, the late right honorable speaker was, was for me a, a, very, a very inspirational person. I think um, the first time I, I saw him physically speak and, and the things, the context under which uh, he was speaking uh, was at Parliament. We had gone for a student debate. And then uh, we had an engagement with members of Parliament, several schools, students, and about 2016, I was in my Form 4 vacation. And then he was, he was Deputy Speaker by then, I think. He was speaking, telling us his history of debating, and then how he made it to Parliament, uh, leadership, and, and all these things. For me, it was it stood out as as a very a very inspirational person, mm -hmm. but 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 even also if you if you took him as a person and then you placed him uh, on the left and then you you view the entire country and the leadership space within which he exists as a country, you could juxtapose them with him, mm -hmm. personal attributes plus where he operates, you would see that there's a there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of you, you know I, I I like to see it as psychologically cognitive dissonance uh, because they, they, they are values as a person you would want to stand by but also there's a context within which you operate which does not want you to operate by those values so ideally we talked about leadership a couple of minutes ago that even if they are good leaders but operating in a system that doesn't necessarily reward goodness it becomes hard to be good so but 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 even 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 towards even towards this end for in, in terms of growth in leadership, I would say he was just at the at 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 at, 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 the, at, at he was just accelerating, not at his peak. Exactly. He was accelerating when you just set off and then you want to add the next mm. the next uh, the, the next gear to accelerate in a mm. journey, and then you couldn't unfortunately accelerate mm. and he left. So maybe you could have done more in terms of parliament. He was a new speaker, maybe then he had the power to now implement his leadership style into the parliament. Perhaps if we still had him, we would be talking about the parliament, not the one we talked about a couple of minutes yeah. ago. Yeah. That, that I am sure there would have been a difference yeah. in, in that. But even what, what then, how as a country did we take his death? Even the cloud around the causes of his death and all those things. Like it's hard for, for a big person of that caliber now in a country like this. Uh, to just die of natural death. Yeah, there are yeah. always going to be fingers pointed and mm. stuff like that. So the death of the speaker, as, as a person, I think he, he, he left before he could do more. Yeah. And then secondly, his death also highlights what, 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 what kind of context the country is operating. Because up to now, there are people who still don't think he died of natural death. Mm. And if that still happens, then like, do we trust ourselves as a country the speaker should be one of the most protected people. If we cannot protect him to an extent we can speculate a natural death of a speaker, mm. then there could be some unsafety somewhere. And maybe things like that can become highlighted because of things like unfortunate death of, of the speaker. All yeah. right, thank you. Your views on the, on, on, on the legacy of the late Jacob Bolanya. 
Oh, well, the late Jacob Olanya, to me, I feel like his death left a very big vacuum mm -hmm. in the country, especially to the students that he was finding, the ones he was paying for school fees, then yeah. to his family, then to the whole parliament as a whole. Because I feel when he was there, whatsoever is happening right now, at least I think a few of them would be minimized. Because right now, if we have speakers that are assembling cars, that are using, with, uh, I feel like the taxpayers feel that like, that, that money, is being used, the taxpayer's money mm -hmm. is being used to buy for the husband, right? Okay. I feel if it was Jacob Olanya, I feel he would he would not do it. Because I feel like... Do you miss him? He was already there. He had <laughs> had it all. He, he was not new in love. Huh? <laughs> you get it. So these are things that would not take him up. I feel we would, not, we would complain less. Mm. So I, I think well, I miss him. Yeah, you would not be excited. Yeah, yeah love would not excite <laughs> me because we would look at it as something very normal. Okay. But right now, we, we feel like love is a very big thing. Okay. He has, it is being drawn out of proportion. Mm. So I really think when, when, it's, when it's your boyfriend's birthday, you, 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 you have to cars. assemble something extraordinarily big yeah, because yeah. we were seeing people wow. telling Magogo mm. that <laughs> all he could do is afford a 200 cake. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for now, we're not going to discuss. I miss him. Um, wow. You miss him, thank yeah. you. Uh, Brian, do you miss him? I, I really do miss him. That, mm. that, that's a fact. I, I really do miss him because contrary to what he said, 2016, I think I met him in uh, 2018. Mm. 2018, that's when I was in my uh, A-level. That's when I met him and was still he was lecturing us on um, governance, politics and the state of the youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he really, th then he was deputy speaker. Yeah. And he really broke down. Even when we asked him, because I think then 2018 is when he had the clash with uh, the speaker, Kadaga. And then we questioned him on on that. And, you know, he broke it down to a more friendly bit. And, you know, you, you know someone who makes leadership look easy. Yeah. I mean, no, come up. Take up the spaces, study. Because he would tell you, if you want to be a leader, then you have to take the time it takes to be a leader. You ought to read. That's why you say, at least he reads, I read, she reads, you read. Yeah. It's because you cannot be a leader when you don't read. And you must at least know everything yes, or something. That's what made him stand out. Because you see, even when he was in parliament, even when you'd call him for a conference, yes, he would address what you want him to address, but then it, we wouldn't stop at that. He would also take you to another dynamic. Mm. And usually he would take you to the business aspect. Mm. Business and then uh, corporate governance. Yeah? Mm, yeah. So he would, if you have invited him to talk to the youth about governance, he will come talk to them about governance and politics and then tell you, however, you need to look at the other side. Because uh, for us, the time when he met us, he told us you cannot survive on, on, um, you cannot survive on one earning, saying that yeah. I'm a lawyer and then everything is going to be in law. No, he will mm. tell you, no, you also have to go to farming. You have to be diverse. Yeah, yeah. Because, so he would always relate us back to his farming. Yeah? Now let's come back to the point where he became speaker. When he became speaker, at least we can testify that the bills that are now being passed through are those that were discussed then. Mm -hmm. that, that is the honest bit. So his legacy is still moving. Yes, the, the, the bills that... No, if, if, if you were to look at the, all the bills that have been passed through this year, those were the bills that were discussed then because he would give you a date to come back and present that thing. So the bills that are now being ratified and what everything, everything asserted to are those that were discussed when he was Impact. speaker. Speaker, yeah. True. Yeah, because when he was speaker, you had people attending because... Actually, I think that's when we had the big attendance of MPs mm -hmm. because at least he would, you know, parliament is the ruling and then the opposing, um, he would balance both sides. But he tried to harmonize. Yes, he parliament. harmonized both sides. That's why you see him and Impoga would talk, him and, uh, so and Semujunga, they would talk. Then antagonism. Yeah. yeah, there was nothing like, also. I'm attacking you because of because you're NIM. No, it was, I'm attacking you because what you're tabling is actually not helping us. Mm -hmm. So you had a generation of sessions that were actually developmental to the country. Because then that's when we actually had the we had the that we had the parliamentary session on uh, on uh, was it uh, was, was it the date mm. and then he tried to bring up um, the time when he questioned Matia Kasaija on the increasing date and all those things yeah, and yeah. saying can't you guys actually have can't you guys actually have an independent bank not more of a bank but a bank account where we can put in some money to <coughs> help reduce and that's yeah. the time when he called right. MPs to at least More put in, in yeah. Okay. Yeah. like so can't we MPs put in at least one percent of of, of 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 our income there and, and then we help you know something so now but then now let's go to the part when he died everything just went still so right. to wrap it up in parliament mm -hmm. uh, in parliament i really miss him mm -hmm. yeah. personally i really do miss him me i didn't i didn't get the chance as him to mm -hmm. Maybe making my personal friend, but at least the number of times I saw him speaking, he was unique.
All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's quite absurd that this year we lost quite a number of significant figures, including recently the death of uh, uh, Dr. Paul Kawanga Semongere. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Kawanga Semongere, for the law students, you know, a locus case for you to understand yeah. in the constitutional law, <laughs> you should have read that case. Yes. And yeah. for the constitutional history of this country as well, he greatly informed and shaped the constitutional history. Mm. So we miss him and we, we, we pray that he's in a better place. Mm. Similarly with the late Jacob Bolanya. And for the young people who are out there, let us possibly try and move in such footsteps to have an impact in this world. Okay. This then brings us to the discussion of Kenya. On 9th of August, Kenya held its uh, presidential elections mm -hmm. and uh, it attracted quite a number of debates across the continent, across the world, mm -hmm. that Kenya in Africa has depicted some aspect of clean democracy. We didn't see violence. We saw what we saw was a country that is uh, peaceful, mm -hmm. that practices democracy to the dot, to the latter. Now, um, Dr. Sarah Birete, uh, she was quoted saying that we need to pick a whole tree from Kenya for Not us to leave. practice democracy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So um, I would like to start with you, Garang. Right. Tell us, um, you know, when we're speaking democracy and when we're speaking as, as a member of uh, the East African, com youth co uh, East African community and a member, mm -hmm. um, tell us, you possibly took part in, uh, in, in, in the process and you also got to know what happened. What do you think we, as, as, as a continent, as Uganda, as a, an East African community, mm. what lessons do we learn as we move to 2023 and subsequent years to come? Mm. What lessons do we learn from the elections that happened in Kenya? So, uh, thank you. I, I think I, there, there, there's a lot mm. that we as, as a country should learn from, from Kenya. And, 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 and I'd like to begin with, 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 uh, with, with a rebuttal to, to, to so many uh, flawed uh, rebuttals that people have to arguments, yeah. like the ones I'm about to make. Because whenever we say we want to learn from countries like Kenya, we don't necessarily say they don't have bad things. True. And we also don't necessarily say that their democracy is highly flawless. Yeah. But we simply say that if there is a marginal difference in how they practice democracy, that should be a justification for why we should learn. Mm. So, so, so even if Kenya has buds or the democracy is not that perfect, there are things we can still learn. Sure. For example, the following one, democracy as an idea does not survive in an illusion or in, 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 in a utopia. It's not some button you press and it works. No, there are structures that make it possible to be actually democratic. Mm. And these are the things we can learn from Kenya. For example, if, 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 if the courts were as independent, if the Ugandan courts were as independent mm -hmm. as the Kenyan courts, we would say then we are at, we, we are a, we are a, a step closer to being democratic, because what what then defines independence of of a court if 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 the other arms of government cannot essentially influence court decisions, if courts can be able to actually uh, make decisions that are based on the principles of rule of law, and and and, and the constitutional provisions, then we can say yes they are independent, but sadly that's not the case. We have seen cases in this country where the courts have been uh, muzzled because of deciding essentially on the principles of the rule of law, but against uh, some, some groups of people and their interests. So if that is not happening, then it is hard. A couple of minutes ago too, we were discussing the, 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 the ideas of parliament. If the parliament is not essentially independent, no, you, you see, you can simply say the constitution provides for an independent parliament. That's true. That's the law we're studying. Mm. But the practice is essentially different. The practice is how the process of becoming a member of parliament is influenced by the ideals and ideology of a party. So that when you go to parliament, you don't essentially go there for, for leadership as a parliamentarian, but essentially as a representative, a representative of, of, your, of party. your party. And if an idea does not, uh, does not uh, resonate with your party, but even if you know it has a lot of influence on the leadership of the state and how development is needed or the democracy in the country, but it doesn't necessarily conform to the ideas of your party, you essentially will oppose it. Now that's, that's, that's where parliament is not independent. And, 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 and if there is a thing we need to learn from Kenya, it is the independence of the arms of government. And again, like I said, by saying independence, it doesn't mean they are completely independent. But to the extent that democracy can be seen to be in practice, 
then we should pick something like that from Kenya. Right. And, 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 and also the kinds of, the kinds of, 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 of structures of the state, because to be democratic, it's not just to say we can have an election every five years, we can vote for our leaders, we can elect people to parliament. Is there a metric for where citizens can essentially hold people to account? In this country, people have fallen victims of, uh, of, of disappearance because of simply questioning. But that is what constitutes accountability. Democracy rests on three principles. The principle of accountability, the principle of participation, and the principle of representation. Yeah. So that I participate in a democratic dispensation, electing my leader, so that they are going to represent me, and then I can hold them to account. Mm. We elect people, fine. But we cannot hold them to account, because when we do that, we are viewed critical, and essentially our security becomes a concern. Mm. So, so those are things that we can learn. From, 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 from countries, not just even Kenya, but even from the books we read at law school about democracy. Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring you Joan. Garang says that democracy rests on three fundamental things. One, participation. Two, representation. Three, accountability. Um, when we have to look into Uganda, he, he, he makes an argument that in, in Uganda, when you, you, you possibly talk or air out your views, the drones would be waiting for you. Yeah. So I would like you to juxtapose what happened in what happened in kenya during the elections with the drone endemic here in uganda what is your say do you think we're a democratic country that we are free to air our views as per the constitution no the democracy in uganda i feel like and, yep. and, and you know, you just recently you were elected as DRC, so I believe it was like one democracy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm not okay, I told you. <laughs> Let's never do it. Yeah. Now, democracy in Uganda, when you talk about democracy in Uganda, okay, yes, we shall say we are, de we are a democratic state. Yeah. But now, <clears throat> just because we have the liberty to vote does not mean that democracy is being exercised. It is on the surface, it is being exercised. But then, when you look into it deeper, the deeper meaning of it, I feel like it is not fair mm. because now when you look at the Kenyans and you juxtapose with the, uh, you just uh, you juxtapose them with Ugandans, when you see the elections, we didn't have uh, people being arrested, we didn't have the opposition, their opposition rather being house arrested, but unlike here in Uganda, we are seeing those things happening live on air and. I think it has become a shred of normalcy these days. It does not make news. A drone, does it really make news? And they, they have, they always defend it. Just of recent, we were seeing Margaret Mohanga. She was saying that there is nothing like a drone. She said, you know that. If it's there, why are they not arresting you? Eh? By the time they arrest you, that means you have done something. But is it really justifiable for me to be taken in a drone that has no number plate? Then later on, they'll, they'll dump you somewhere, you don't know. Then the people that are coming up saying they've been taken in these drones, they come back with wounds. Get, I mean, it is, it is bringing about a traumatized generation. But we didn't see that in Kenya. At least at point in Kenya, we didn't see them, like, we didn't see the social media off. Unlike here in Uganda, the social media was off completely, I think, for days. Then we're wondering, where are the election results of the, of the TV stations coming from? You get. Where were they coming from? Where are they getting these election results? If the if social media was completely off, if network was completely down, yeah. I think that is what I'm saying. On the surface, we do have the democracy, okay. but now when you look into it, I feel it is not it is not fair enough. All right. So your argument is the theoretical aspect of the, <laughs> the face of it. They portray it as we have democracy because people think democracy is just a matter of electing or having people mm -hmm. go for for polling day and line up and then yes. vote. Yeah. Well, and we take pics. I... You'll be like, yes, <laughs> I, I voted, I have the marker. Right. But in actual sense. Okay, because the other aspect of accountability, oh, wow. representation and participation that you raise is mm -hmm. unlocking. Mm -hmm. Phil, I'd like to bring you, <laughs> Brian. Um, as Kenya were holding elections, we had a number of by-elections that also happened in this country. Mm -hmm. The courts uh, nullified in a number of, uh, a number of, 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 of of elections that had mm. occurred and passed that they should go for by-elections. Mm. Others, we saw some seats being left empty mm. because of the demise of some people. So um, as Kenya, 
platforms. As Garang said, uh, if we are speaking that Kenya practice democracy, we should also note that they also had some sort of, yeah. they also have their flaws. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you are talking about the democracy that they practice, in relation to Uganda, <clears throat> to our by-elections that we had, we saw what happened in Imbali mm -hmm. when, uh, when, 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 when the likes of Doreen Nyanjura were mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. You saw what happened. Yeah. And then also what happened, possibly other people argue in Soroti and the likes. Mm -hmm. What would you, juxtaposing the two, would you say Uganda is a democratic country because we, we have people going to the poll and then electing? Or, or democracy is one that is related to people freely exercising their will, mm -hmm. but also when they're exercising their will, they have the right to freely, to freely participate in the process. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> I, I believe we are democratic. Maybe to start with that. Mm. But I don't believe in the narrative that uh, democracy is all about voting. Mm. Yeah? By you being democratic, <coughs> one that means you can, um, you put uh, constitutional applicability into play. Mm. Secondly, that means you have the freedom of expressing your views and, you know, you stay with that freedom after. Yeah, that mm. means you can freely say out something and still walk away, yeah. you know, uh, bring it to the political sphere that I have freedom of speech and I also have freedom after speech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that, then the whole narrative of democracy tends to go down. But then again, that doesn't mean that your country doesn't have democracy. You see, to the layman, democracy could be that maybe after every after four years, we are, we are going to go and vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be the interpretation. But then Let's let's break this down from the national, and then we go now to the, you know, to, to the grassroots. Democracy, yes, is there. For example, institutions. I think we, the youth, at least have shown what democracy should be in Uganda. Yeah, come down to the universities and stuff and stuff. Where, but you know, you are going to maybe need a certain requirement to go for a certain position, and there is a certain people that are going to vote you maybe because they know you are competent or that. But then you also know that I'm holding this period for. This, this office for a certain period of period time. Of time sure. yeah? So, for example, you cannot be guild president two times. Mm. Yeah, it becomes very funny. Could, could, could then that be as a result that in universities we have a, a, a streamlined mode of operation as opposed to a country mm. that possibly has a constitution but we lack the culture and base that respects rule of law? Exactly what I'm coming to, that at the grassroots level, mm that democratic bit is actually being implemented. At the national level, it's being left to the part of where people think democracy is all about voting my candidate, taking pics, and showing the thumbnails that have voted. Yeah, Because if we want to say that we have democracy, yes, Kenya is not necessarily perfect, but at least they try to show us something. That, look, we have a constitution. The constitution says after two terms, you cannot come. If you contest this term, and then you win, and the next term you, you, you are defeated, you actually still have one term, you can still contest again, yeah? Or if you've done two terms, you've, I mean, because uh, the former president had done two terms, mm -hmm. he had won the previous one, he had won the previous one. So, but then he wouldn't come. Reason, that is what the constitution is saying. Then yes, you can say we have democracy. It may not be the perfect one, but at least it's something that gives hope to the younger generation. Because you see, democracy is generational. Mm -hmm. What someone does today <clears throat> is 85% what the next person will do the next day. If I hold power for 36 years, trust me, the next leader that is going to come, is, there, there is no way you're going to tell him to rule for five years. It's because there is a precedence that has already been set. Look before President Museveni came into power. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had a generation of, of presidents who are coming in two months, what, you overthrown, two months, what, you overthrown. You see, there was already something whereby someone knows, ah, not me when I come, I may rule for a certain period of time, but I'll be taken off. Yeah. But now what President Museveni has said is that now you, you have things like Toji Kwata. You, you have a number of constitutional amendments. Now that comes down to us. It, constitutional amendment, just know it affects people. It may have, yes, there will be the sympathizers who are saying, no, this is good for our nation. We need the person to come. He has experience. But you, you, you see, one other thing is that the more you put someone, the, the, the more times you put someone into it, a certain position, the more you're actually killing the spirit of patriotism in a country. Mm. Yeah. If you have, because like now people are saying they're endorsing President Museveni to come back for 2026. If he did comes back, then you're looking at the political aspect of people being put to the ground because then you're going to have what she's talking about, the drones coming back. 
you're going to have what he's talking about uh, people not being held accountable because then you'll have people who have been in leadership for maybe since 2000 and they will tell you, no, this is my kingdom. Right. Um, this this constituency is mine. And yeah, so the younger generation, us who actually have new ideas, mm. and that is what is bringing the fight between uh, General Otafiri and uh, the deputy speaker, uh, and, and, and the deputy speaker, Taiwan. All, all the right. generation vis-a-vis -vis the right. generation. All right. So speaking of uh, intergenerational conflict, the old <laughs> and the new, Gen Z Sorry. and then... <laughs> The others. So uh, this brings me to a, a recent, I think, a recent intergenerational conflict, mm -hmm. po possibly that is being uh, depicted over Twitter by a famous man called <laughs> Mohozi Hainero <laughs> Um We are speaking about uh, events that mm -hmm. have informed or that have shaped the country. Uh, Mohozi has been tweeting, and his tweets have uh, arisen a number of controversial conversations, mm -hmm. has sparked fights between the old and the new mm -hmm. and recently he tweeted about the NRM being bad now people are wondering which side is he mm -hmm. so uh, as we are discussing about uh, events that unfolded or that events that shaped the year I'd like to start with you Garang mm -hmm. um, I believe you've been following those tweets <laughs> and as a student of law I believe you know that if you hold a particular position or you <clears throat> hold a particular stature in society you ought to behave in particular form mm -hmm. and for a person like Muhozi what do you make up of his tweets? Do you think is 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 it more of a move? Is it a stunt? Is it planning something? Mm. So, <laughs> if you asked me this question uh, a month ago, I would say uh, he's just clueless, mm. he's delusioned, yeah. and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. But very recently, I have I have seen it's more of a strategy. I think mm. uh, it's more of a strategy because he has he has he he, he has. Um, he wants to lead this country one day as a president. And I think that has been very clear mm. in all his messages. He hopes to become president of Uganda, and he might become one, certainly. So, and, and, and media is a very important component in politics, especially in terms of how it shapes people's perception about particular individuals and how they will perform in politics as leaders, or essentially how they are as people. So I think I think Moses is doing a very robust media campaign to sort of create for himself a political position mm. that will either endorse his coming or cause his coming. These are two different things. Because endorsing his coming might well, maybe he will come whether people want him or not. But then there should be a group of people that would agree that he has come. Mm. That is endorsing. And then there are people who will actually cause his coming, will essentially want him to come. That means if he participates in a political dispensation, people actually will vote for him. So if, when he started tweeting like that, it, it, it appeared like maybe maybe just this is a reckless person who was who is drunk on a Friday, like people usually say. But I think right now I think it's a it's a strategy. It's a political strategy to uh to to to, to turn the media attention to himself. And by that turn the, 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 the people's attention to himself. And then people will start discussing the things he says about his politics. He started by saying controversial things about internal operations of, of, of the armed forces, uh, how they are performing in Congo, the relationship between Uganda and countries, neighboring countries, and so on and so forth. Then he has transitioned now to, 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 to resonating with the youth because that, that, that's a big group of voters. If you mm -hmm. come tomorrow on a ballot paper, mm. that's a group of people you should appeal to if you want to win. Sure. So he has now come to identify as, as a youth, a young person that is fighting for the interest of the young people because the old have essentially been there forever. So what he simply wants is space and a following so that when he comes, there will be people that follow him. But also, uh, so the kind of the kind of choice, and, and, and this is where there, there, there could be a problem, because he has not been a normal person. He has not, not been a Douglas or a Brian or a Joan or a, a usual Garang. No. He has been serving in the armed forces. He's a serviceman. He has, he has state information that maybe people don't have or people should not have in terms of the, the national security of this country. So that, that, should, that should inform how he engages in the things he says. For example, there was this tweet that almost caused issues with, with, with neighbors like, like Kenya. So maybe that, 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 that should be where it comes in. That as you look for media attention, as you create propaganda that favors you, 
maybe you should be able to keep in mind that there is a line that defines what you should say and so on. The president had to apologize on behalf of the country because uh, it, it was a diplomatic issue and, 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 and because it made sense that way, because it was said by him. He's a general, he's a first son. He's not just a general, he's, he's high profile. Mm -hmm. He has led land forces and, 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 and the special forces. So he's not just the usual person. So his statements cannot be taken to, to hold no water. Mm -hmm. and, and so him is looking for a position and find position in 2022 politically in the era of Twitter, Facebook and so on. You will need media. And I think that's what he's doing. Because right now it is not only actually social media. I've seen stories in Monitor that glorify him as a good person that has fought for this country, that it is time now for us, the young people, to rally behind him. This is a media strategy. Leaders have used this strategy for so many times. And if that is his strategy, if you can keep it clean of the national secrets, what's the problem? All right. Yeah. Thank you. Joan, Garan makes a point that um, in this 21st century, it's very important to have the media on your side. And possibly what Muhozi is doing with uh, the tweets that he makes and the recent, uh, the, the recent articles in, in the Daily Monitor that appear in his favor mm. could possibly be, uh, could possibly be um, a strategy to aid his, his, his run for presidency in 2026. What do you think is the role of media in this? Because we have seen countries like China with CGTN, mm. US with CNN, uh, the BBC with the UK, all have a pattern that the media moves hand in hand with the state. So what do you think is the role of media, particularly with the, in relation to what Muhozi is trying to do? No, the current, the current Uganda mm. right now, media is playing a very big role mm. and people are giving it a lot of attention. Mm. You cannot do politics without including media nowadays because when you look at the previous times we have been using newspapers and when you want to hide information from an African, Put it in writing. Put it in writing. And the way you put it in writing, my friend, mm -hmm. no one is going to give you attention. True. But now when, when he makes it a tweet on Twitter, mm -hmm. these days everyone is on their phone. You want to make something important, just put it on your phone. There, mm -hmm. is, there is a page on Twitter called Weird Confessions. You know, everyone thinks <laughs> it is full of nonsense. You get yeah. weird confessions like you hear it. But now when you look into those weird confessions, what is going on? Reality. Realities. Reality. We have Twitter influencers. These are people that are being paid. They have, they have gigs. Everyone is giving them attention. And then they have the Twitter warriors. Mm. These ones that are very bad when it comes to the keyboard. Mm. Small, small tweet from Mohoz, and they're already defending him. Mm. Then we have those ones. You know, there are people that just come out to speak, not because they want to win the argument, but because they want the argument to, be to go happening. on. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. No. So, so <coughs> they'll keep, he'll keep tweeting this. We call them funny tweets. If at some point people think he's drunk, he's, he's drunk mm. but you might find that in actual sense he's not. Yeah. He's trying to keep relevant and to give him the relevancy by giving him our attention. Realize that most of the youths right now are unemployed, right? People have graduated, but where are people right now? People are at home. All they have, the only rich thing they have with them is a possession of a phone. Now with my phone of 300, a smartphone of 300,000, do you know how much, how much I can do with it? People are being employed because of those points. Social, network is, social networking is on points, right? So now, if someone comes up to this student, to this unemployed youth, yeah. mm. 200,000, move the hashtag, yeah. Mohoz for president, M20 what? MK, MK, 2026. MK 2026. Stand by generator. You expect me to refuse? <laughs> Who am I? Okay, okay. You, you, you know my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. So now, I think media is, a, uh, is playing a very, very big role these days. Yeah. You can't sideline it. You will, not come, you will not move physically, person to person. You can just go to, he can carry it, a simple charity organization. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't post it, how shall we know? Then someone will, will come and say, he's just bragging. But in actual sense, he's not bragging. Mm -hmm. you, you, we Africans, we believe by saying, how shall we know that he's kind when he has not when he has not posted it on social media. Mm. Because, you know, we Africans, you do something good, we shall check that. But the moment you do something very, very bad, small like this, shall publicize. my oh. Lord, we shall make, we shall, we shall, it, it will become a storm in a small tickle. You get, oh, just right. like when you look at Thomas Taeba, people, every time he does something, they'll troll him, he mm. beat a what? 
Aumeme mine. Okay, so it keeps coming back to him. Now, I feel that if Mohoz uses this social media, we, the um, unemployed youth, and we give him our attention, that is how we're going to move his thing. So by the time even the most ignorant people behind the, who, who are not on social media, when they hear us talk, now they'll be like, by this man, the first son, you know what he tweeted? Then I'll explain it to my village mom. Then my village mom also move that information. Mm. That is how everyone is going to come to know about Bohozi. Right. And that is how that the thing is going to move. Everyone will get to know him, mm. things of that sort. Because when you get the information from Twitter, they're taking it direct to Facebook and they're becoming memes on what? On Facebook. Mm. Now it starts moving. Then we give him the due attention. Then that is where daily monitor is going to come in. Yeah. Then they will defend him. Okay, then most now. of the youths are going to come and line up behind yeah. him. Thank you. Um, mm. Garang and you, John, make a very, very interesting argument. Garang makes an argument that Muhozi's tweets are primarily a political strategy. Okay. And you come and discuss for us the role of media. And you tell us that it's, it's, it's very pertinent in this 21st century to have a media on your side. Possibly for him, his strategy is via his tweets because he's attracting a lot of attention. Whether good or bad, mm. he doesn't doesn't matter. For him, all, 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 most important thing is attention. People are talking about him. No yes. publicity like is doing, bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Garang made the point that uh, there was a time when Muhozi tweeted, uh, when they tweeted on the president's page about mm. uh, an operation mm. in DRC Congo. Remember the operation that is happening in DRC Congo? It's yeah. termed as Operation Shuja. And we saw what Muhozi Kariyagaba did. He commented and said that uh, my, my father's uh, people, the, the, the people who handle my father's account should be fired because this is classified information. And in that particular moment, for maybe for the viewers out there, op Operation Shuja, in the in last year, 2021, on 16th November, three suicide bombers attacked Uganda, uh, one next to parliament, the other in front of uh, the headquarters of police in Kampala. When that happened, the president uh, called for a press conference and said that you have attacked us, now we shall bring the war to you. So then the president took, uh, uh, sent the army, what was termed as Operation Shuja, yeah. to, DR, to DRC Congo to go and combat the rebels in Congo. And I would like to uh, engage with you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Mohozi, when he commented about that, that this is classified information, people are like, for once, he has said something that is quite sensible. So, comment on whether you think Muhozi is just using media as a strategy. And secondly, comment on the aspect of Operation Shuja, whether you think it is a failed project or it's a success. Okay, thank you. I think let me start with the first of the media. When we are looking at what MK has done, at least we, sh we, we, we can ably say that uh, 2020 towards this year, yeah. he has hit the all time maximum I think that he has had as a person. Mm. The role of the media and MK, uh, I think we should really applaud the MK for this year. Mm. On mm. being smart, visionary and a good strategist mm. because he has really used everything in his possibility to reach where he wants. On the part of visionary, if he indeed wants to come to 2026, what he has done this year at least has already set pace for him because at least I'm very sure whether he go to what part of Uganda, MK is known. Either he may be known as Muhozi, or he may be under MK project, or it may be team chairman, or MK, but at least the name is there. As to him being a strategist, using media, I think that has really worked favorably for him, because mm -hmm. uh, there is a night when he made a number of tweets, and uh, I think he hit 150 followers in the space of a night. Uh, that's not something, you know, just anyone can do. On him using media for any other thing he has done, it really works for him as a person. Yeah. So I must really say, I, I, I must commend because not all of us have the ability to do that. Whether he's the first son, whether he's the former commander land forces, whether he's the former commander of the special forces command, that is, you know, primarily what we can be seeing. But uh, him using the media as a tool, as his stepping tool, that has clearly worked for him because you see now he has a number of people who say they do believe in him and they are willing to do whatever it takes for him to reach that. For example, you saw uh, there was an article by, um, by um, Jordan Dungu. It's the one you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And then he came out and said for once, Daily Monitor has actually, you know, made something in, you know, that actually supports me. Mm. Yeah. 
by the time you get off Twitter and say maybe because the, the, the campaign on Twitter, most people may think it's on Twitter. There is something on Facebook and it's actually big because, you know, most people don't use Twitter in Uganda. Most people on Facebook, what is there is actually big. But because he usually uses Twitter, I think that's where everything is stemming up from. But he has really used it and it has worked for him. It has gotten him the numbers. All these things he has been organizing, at least you've seen people coming up and taking up. Yeah, yeah. So if, if that's his tool to maybe say come for 2026, personally, that's a smart move for him. He has done it and at least at, at this point of time, we should, at least we are very sure and we can say possibly if he comes here, he's going to have the numbers. Yeah. As he said, he has brought about a system that is working for himself. Role of media, he has the media. All right. Tackling um, the youth, I um, think he has gotten um, the youth. I would like you to first engage on the aspect of uh, Operation Trojan. Mm. Is it failed? Is it a success one year later? I wouldn't say it's failed. Mm. And I wouldn't say it's a success. That's, that's a two by standard move because uh, Operation Shunja, let's look at uh, from the time when the Kampala was attacked, mm. uh, the suicide bombings and everything. And then we said, let's take the word to them. At least we must say, in the first month, there was really a rapid stage. We got the coverage. We had Oh, at, at least we, the civilians, saw what was actually happening, yeah. you know, because there was coverage at least for everything, there was accountability for everything. I think along the way, I don't know, mm. I think along the way certain information now stayed as classified information. Mm. And that's why maybe there is no, you know, adequate information on certain things. And that brings again to the tweet that was made by uh, the president. And then uh, MK came out and said, no, I think these people should be sacked because now you know, it brings a controversy to what people, what we should get mm. and what shouldn't be fed to us. Along the way, I think it started failing. It may not necessarily be failing, but I think it started failing, especially on the part of transparency. So it lost its essence. <clears throat> mm. Because if you start something and then you say, we are starting it on the part of transparency, we are going to give people, then let it be a constant. Let it be a bare minimum. Don't reach at a certain point X and say, ah, no, I think, you know. Because you see, at Operation Shunja started moving forward, then we, again we saw a number of uh, shuffles okay. within, the, within, within the military ranking. Mm. All right. Yeah. Um, as we near towards the end of our conversation, I would like us to briefly talk about uh, recently we, they concluded the COP27, wherein uh, the, the resolution was passed for the loss and damage fund. Mm. And before the COP27, we experienced the stop ear COP here in Uganda. Garang, I understand you're a quite passionate person about matters relating to climate change and uh, Stop IACOP. Briefly, tell us, what are your views on Stop IACOP and uh, COP27? I think, uh, it's, uh, without any fear of being politically correct, I think this was a very stupid idea to, to move a campaign against uh, the, 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 the IACOP, I mean, by, 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 by people who are Ugandans, because mm. I think Uganda daily needs a project like the mm. ECOP. So, you see, we know where climate change is. Even the people that push the narrative mm -hmm. also know it. But uh, from historical background, we, we, we know what people did to affect the climate. Mm. Most of it was from them, mm. the West, France, let's just say Europe. Mm. And America and all the of industrial them. Industrial revolution. Mm. The worst part of climate uh, climate destruction was by it's actions from, they did, yeah. right? But even if that is the case, if time has come for us to solve it, then we should solve it collectively. But I think there is more hi hypocrisy in solving or in in preventing climate change mm. than in doing that. And and what hurts so much, and that's why I call the whole eco stop eco campaign a stupid idea, is that people in third world or in Uganda need projects like the eco it's it's a pipeline project that is going to export oil that is going to enrich the economy mm -hmm. before before the the, the 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 european parliament moved the motion against the the, the 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 project no one in this country was going to stop it or had started running the campaign mm -hmm. but when they moved the motion and money started or opportunities for money started mm -hmm. to show mm -hmm. people started pushing such narrative to stop eco so I think we, 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 we don't do analysis so much because the same European Parliament that was going to ask us to stop projects mm -hmm. for two reasons. One, among others, they said, one, there, there, there was climate change. Mm -hmm. Then two, there was going to be human rights human violation rights. in terms of property and stuff. Mm -hmm. The laws provide for how land is acquired. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another discussion. Mm -hmm. But even if it is on human rights, 
The idea was, you see, a very remote argument. Money is going to be made from the project. That money will be used to buy uh, things to molest Ugandans. That's violation of human rights. So the project should stop. (laughs) Silly. Secondly, they say there's going to be climate change because the project is releasing fossils. Another silly idea. Not because it cannot, but because it is not collective. In the same period, they were busy funding coal in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Coal also emits carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. They were releasing money to fund that project. But they're stopping us from pushing our project because of climate change. It doesn't make any logical sense. But even secondly, if the the problem is that money is going to be spent on molesting Ugandans, Mm. there is evidence that even if we don't make that money, the country will still go and borrow money and buy tear gas and molest. So the problem is not essentially that money is being used, but the problem is the existence of a system that enables people to be molested. So if you wanted to do a campaign, you should do a campaign against molesting people, not against where the money comes from. Mm. If you want to do a campaign to save the climate, you should do it again against those projects of theirs that they do to, 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 to fund fossil fuels in some other parts of the world. So I think the, the, the campaign was very bad. The project may have downs and ups, but as a third world country that needs such project, we should have appreciated the project and defended it. But right. sadly, people refuse to do that. Thank yeah. you. Um, as we're nearing towards the end, I would like you, uh, Joanne, to briefly tell us about the Kayola buses. Do you think that's a good move? Because we have seen them moving around. Uh, these Kayola buses are made by Kira EV, and they are uh, they are operated by batteries and do not emit fossils. And we are combating climate change. Do you think uh, Kira needs more funding? They need to be supported more. Okay, those Kyola buses, basically they're not bad. Mm. But now the problem comes in is that they pack a lot of people. Okay, because it is affordable. Mm. It is very cheap. But when it comes to overloading them, <coughs> yeah, they're not allowing yeah. these normal taxes to, to be overloaded. I feel like they should they should adhere to the traffic rules as well. Because only imposing rules on the traf- on the on these other taxes and the same rules are not being impl- uh, implemented on these Kyola buses, mm. it is not fair. It does it does not look fair to 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 the countrymen and, and women. Now, when it comes to the use of fossils, I feel it is it is very good because depending on fuel alone is because now when you look at the Russia Ukraine uh, Ukraine war. We are being affected because of the fuel. The fuel prices have gone up. Yeah. But now when we use fossils, I feel like it is co- it, it is going to complement the use of fuel. Well. It will it will minimize the 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 what? What should I say? The emission of us. Emission. Yeah. Emission. Exactly. All right, thank you. Um as we I would like to engage with you, Brian, oh. briefly. Um the youth have taken the forefront on the fight against climate change. Mm. Uh, they, they recently concluded COP27. We saw a number of youths from Uganda, Kenya, mm. and Africa, and then the continent, the world at large, participated in that uh, in that conference. Mm. Uh, what role as young people do we have to play in the fight against climate change? Briefly. Oh, thank you. Our role can be broken down to being good researchers, mm. advocacy, and implementation. Because other than that, I, we, we don't have the funding. We, we cannot say we are going to fund something. At least that one, at least we can take that out. That would be a rather very, very silly idea. But we can, however, because it's a climate activist, mm-hmm. we can, however, do make research, yeah. yeah, on you know the dangers of you know climate activism when it goes bad or when it goes well. You know, you have to look at both sides, yeah. Climate activism on the international scale and also on the national scale. That is, Uganda, since we are in Uganda, and then other jurisdictions. So we should really study then we can advocate. Mm. So we are looking at the SDG that looks at climate action. How are we going to help uh, break down the analysis of climate action? From English, from the very complicated legal terminologies and conferences to that people themselves. Can we go down to the grassroots and tell people, look, mm. this is everything about climate activism. We are going to bring, if, if I'm a Mnyankola, and then we say we are going to Western Uganda, at least we have people who can break this thing, the concept of climate activism, to the local understanding, and then we get people moving. Right. Implementation, telling people what is actually needed, telling them that if you cut one tree down, fine, but at least grow two trees to replace. To replace, other. yeah. So at replace something, but then with another uh, added value. Because you see, if you don't advocate for climate, more likely 
your children or grandchildren are going to suffer from the problems of deforestation and the problems of poor right. climate. That right. is it. Thank you. Um, for those who are just joining us now, we are discussing, uh, we are discussing uh, events that shaped the country. Uh, with me here, I was, I was, I'm joined with a, with a panel of distinguished lady and gentlemen who have ably discussed the events that uh, that's, that's informed the politics, the economics of the world and the country. Uh, before we conclude, I would give, I would give all, uh, each panelist a minute to tell us what, what, what advice they have to give the country as we end and as we come into the next year, and possibly wish their loved ones a happy, <laughs> a happy Christmas <laughs> and a happy new year, and then uh, we can call it a show. I would start from my extreme left as we come like this. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. It's 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 been a pleasure to uh, appear on this show. I've been here severally and discussing so many things, and um, I'm always delighted, and I don't take it for granted. And then uh, I I think uh, to 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 the rest of us, I think as a country we are we are about to to start a new year, and there's going to be a lot of new things. So my message is just going to be very simple. So. As an individual, as you start this new year, what what do you want to to, to, to do differently uh, from what you have been doing, and and what are the things you want to change, and what are the things you need to start doing, and then secondly, I, I want you people to maybe start becoming more active citizens and not just passive. It, it's passive is when you receive it as it is, but being an active citizen is if you can actually participate in getting to know how you are governed and, and and why things happen the way they do and maybe find ways of contributing to uh, how your future is being shaped because uh, that's very important. Otherwise, Happy New Year. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be hosted here. It's, it, it has been my first time and I can, sh I can say it has really been a great experience. At first I was nervous, you know, but Brian had to calm me down. I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad. I later on caught up. Mm -hmm. I'm so honored to be here. And my message to, to the general public about the coming year is that they should be determined, they should know what they want in life, because we only have one life. So they have to be very careful with it. Well, as we go into this seasonal festivities, people become very reckless. So I just caution them to be very careful. Uh, otherwise, happy new year. Thank you. Well, being a youth activist, I kindly appeal to my fellow youth <laughs> to take up all the energy they need and uh, put their brains to the test because I'm very sure we haven't implemented a number of things, but uh, let's take up the urge of prayer, belief, teamwork, and reading. Yeah. That's all. Thank you very much. As we have come to the end of the show, as you have noticed, this edition or this uh, panel of the Inter-University Interface has a diverse, uh, a diverse oh. panel because we have a student from I'm from Kumba University, from Chambogo University, from Cavendish University. It's a special edition and we have summed up the events that are from the politics of this country. As we near the end of, of, the, of 2022, my appeal to, the, to everyone out there, to the young people out there, let's uh, engage in, let's engage in conversations, let, uh, let's pick interest in reading, let's participate more actively in, uh, in, 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 uh, in spaces so that we inform the politics of this nation. We make the country, Uganda a better place. From me and the team here, I would like to say thank you to the technical team, Rashid and the team. I would like to say thank you to Center for Constitutional Governance for giving young people this opportunity. And uh, for those who are new to the, to the channel, those who are new to Civic Space TV, please subscribe and uh, feel free to engage um, the conversation on the comment section. Otherwise, for me and the team, Thank you very much, and we remain honored and happy. Please continue watching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Till next time.